So when last we left our hero, we were playing around with the i7-7700, or the Optiplex that had the Intel i7-7700 in it. And we were trying a couple of different video cards to kind of find out what you should and shouldn't put in there. But one of the things that I did not mention about what you should not put in there was an ARC A380. We're, we're going to tell you why, and we're also going to tell you why that's not necessarily all bad. Okay, so to start with, what we did is we went ahead and got the 6 gig version of it by Sparkle. It, they call it the ELF. It's no power needed. It is a 6 gig A380 uh, built on the same technology that the ARC A750, ARC A770 are. And um, it's a newer, obviously a little bit newer technology. It's got some drawbacks, especially when you're trying to use it with older equipment. One of the things about this particular type of card or Intel's cards is they take advantage of resizable bar, which means that the processing goes directly from, say, your storage into the memory of the GPU, bypassing the process of going through the CPU. That doesn't always work because some BIOSes are not set up to be able to do that. Some don't, can't handle a process like that. So you are missing a vital link in a, uh, in a GPU such as this. And that becomes very evident when we're trying to compare the uh, ARC A380 to other video cards in, say, an older platform like the i7-7700. For instance, uh, things, were, and we'll kind of go through these. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but we'll kind of go through and I'll, I'll kind of give you a hint or let you know that it did not do really that well at all. And it underperformed even the RX 6400, which I thought was a much better choice. The best choice for that power limits notwithstanding i believe are the gtx 1660 but uh trying to use th this type of card you can't use that resizable bar and so it does make a difference now on something like shadow of the tomb raider we were lucky to get even on 1080p low we were lucky to get 42 to 43 frames per second uh, we could establish 30 frames per second in just about every game we tried but again this is not ideal uh, this is last generation console and we're talking about a brand new card. Now, the good about this card is it only does cost between 100 and 120 bucks. There are some other good features. Doesn't need power. So that's, again, that really does well. If you're looking for something ultra budget and you can handle running 30 frames per second with a couple of other features, it might not be such a bad thing. But Shadow of the Tomb Raider is not that difficult a game. And we only managed about 43 frames per second at the very best. Uh, Borderlands 3, uh, again, that was another one that struggled. Uh, and we do know that sometimes this one does tax video cards. It just it just does, especially in DX11. It does have a DX12 implementation that, that is much better, much faster. But still, we do know that uh, DX11 doesn't work well with ARC cards too, including the A750. And we'll discuss that in a little bit later as well. One of the big drawbacks... Obviously, we said that it's going to cause some problems trying to run some games. In this case, it would not even run Cyberpunk. We couldn't even start it. It just told us, hey, bro, there's a problem. So in that typical, I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen it if your Cyberpunk installation has failed more than once. You get that little banner that says it's not going to run. It just it simply wouldn't do it. Uh, so no comparison here. We couldn't even get the 30 frames per second. Now, to keep in mind, that's what the RX 6400 was getting in Cyberpunk, and we couldn't even manage that in this game. Forza Horizon 5 did a little bit better, but it was on par with the other games we'd already tested, between about 30 frames per second for high and around 42, 43 for low. Now, this is pretty consistent with other games that we saw, and in fact, a lot of these games were between 30 and 40 frames per second, which was a little bit surprising, but not overly surprising. Again, we're handicapped by a few of the things, a few of the implementations that Intel chooses to use that we just don't get to take advantage of, or uh, don't get to, we don't get the resources to be able to use within older architecture. With some of the esports titles like Counter Strike 2, not really a problem at all. Uh, 80 frames per second here, it, it worked really strong. It didn't have any kind of issues. Now the other cards did do much better. They were both over 100 frames per second, but still. This is a budget card, and it costs less than those other two cards. And, uh, yeah, you get kind of get what you pay for. But remember, again, this title is on DX11, which it just became DX11. It used to be DX9. Uh, when they upgraded it to Counter-Strike 2 from CSGO, 
then they got the new API, the new implementation for the graphics. Um, it's this isn't the best. Art cards aren't the best in DX11, but they're trying. In any case, this still worked out okay at 80 frames per second. So you couldn't couldn't be too upset, but still not ideal. And you're thinking, but Paul, if this thing's only going to get 30 frames per second, why why should I even spend a hundred dollars on it? I can buy a used card for you know for better, and you can. But there are some redeeming qualities, and we're going to talk about a couple of them. But but we didn't just try this with an older i7. We went ahead and tried this with a relatively newer i7 as well. 12700KF is in my rig behind me. It's the editing rig. We went ahead and swapped it in there. It currently has an A750, and so that is one of the cards we compared it to. No, it's not going to come close to the A750, but we're just giving you an apples-to-apples -apples comparison with the ARC cards to kind of let you know where it falls in comparison to that. And where it falls is not bad. We're getting over 60 frames per second. As a matter of fact, on 1080p low, we could probably push 70 frames per second on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, for instance. Uh, yeah, it does make a big difference with being able to use that resizable bar. Uh, it is a newer process, obviously a newer motherboard and all that. But from going from uh, 40 frames per second on 1080p low with the older i7 and then the newer i7 getting 44 frames per second high... Um, that's not horrible, you know, and we were getting 60 frames per second. I think you could leave this on medium or low and be just fine. Uh, similar thing with Borderlands 3. Now, you're going to see there is a difference in Borderlands 3 here with the GTX 1660 and the ARC A750. Remember before, when we were first testing this ARC A750, Borderlands 3 was one of the car, one of the games that the RK750 had a problem with with that DX11. Uh, it does run much smoother in DX12, but I wanted to keep apples to apples here. We tested the GTX 1660 with DX11. We've tested all the rest of them with DX11. I stayed with DX11 because for the most part, in other applications, DX11 is still a little bit faster than DX12. Even though the ARC cards suffer a little bit with DX11, we still got a very playable experience out of this. Uh, with, with 1080p medium running over 60 frames per second, still we're in pretty good shape. So this is not turning out to be so bad after all if you have a little bit newer card or if you have a little bit newer CPU and architecture. Uh, for If you're going to spend a decent amount on a CPU and motherboard and you still want to play some things, you might be able to cut the budget a little bit and spend 100 or 120 bucks to have this hold you over while you get a better card. Still, we're going to talk about one of the other benefits in a few minutes here. We haven't gotten to it yet. For Cyberpunk 2077, not only did we get it to work with the 12700KF, we also got 60 frames per second at 1080p low. So working with that newer platform and using the resizable bar not only worked, but it worked fairly well. Now, I did use the XESS that came already in you know, basically as a default. Whatever the default was, low, medium, or high, I used it. I didn't change any other settings. We just set it up and ran with it like that. So uh, it does have some implementation of that, but it also does that with NVIDIA and also does that with AMD cards. So I didn't see much of a difference in trying to measure that. Now, the one thing you're going to find is that uh, with especially the GTX 1660, you don't have ray tracing or anything like that, but you still do have some upscaling that's available through AMD in any case. Uh, Cyberpunk's 2077 did run with this card, ran in between 45 and 60 frames per second, depending on what your settings were in 1080p, and I was pretty pretty satisfied and pretty happy with getting a result, first of all, but having it turn out decent uh, really made a difference. Forza Horizon 5 card did actually pretty well, even at uh, 1080p high. Now, this does have extreme, uh, it has ultra and extreme settings, although I tested all that stuff and tested at 1440. All I'm listing here is high, medium, and low. Uh, it turned out pretty well. It, it ran anywhere from the 67 frames per second on high to about 80-something, 80 87 on low, 1080p low. So, really, for 100 bucks, $110, uh, I think this card cost me, uh, including tax and everything, like 119 or something. Um, for that small amount of money, to be able to get almost 90 frames per second, 1080p, 1080p low on Forza Horizon 5, it's not horrible. I mean, it does run, that, that game does run pretty easily on, on most cards. 
But I mean, it was a pretty good experience and it, it, it did really well. The only thing I will say about it is every time I go to load Forza Horizon 5 into a new computer, it does take a while for the textures to load. Now on, on the i7 7700, it took quite a while. And I think I mentioned that in that video. But once it loaded all the textures in, boom, I didn't have any issues at all. And, and including with this card. It ran very, very well and did, it did uh, a good job. And I was pretty happy with it overall. Uh, it, at this point, I'm thinking, this is not so bad. And, and if I've got a newer setup, then I can play games at this 60 frames per second all day long between 60 and 90 frames per second and be pretty happy. Uh, it's something that as, uh, as a general use video card is pretty good. Is it a gaming video card? No, and I wouldn't expect it without needing power and for only 110 bucks or whatever to be uh, something that would rival, say, a, a 3060 or a 6600 or anything like that. Okay, now for one of the redeeming qualities on this card. Uh, now, the RK750, that's in my editing rig for a reason. It's because I use the AV1 encoder to go ahead and upload videos on YouTube similar to this one. In fact, the last video I had was on that i7-7700 in the Optiplex. That was a 12-minute, 12 12-second 12 video. When I did it with the RK750 and I rendered that video, it was a little over two, two minutes and a half. Uh, it averaged out to be about 155 seconds. I, I ran several runs and they were really, really close within that. I ran it with this, same 12 minutes, 12 seconds. 121 seconds was my fastest time on here. So... I'm not going to say it's going to run 121 seconds every single time, but I am going to say it, it is in lockstep with that A750. And even though this has 6 gigs of memory and the other one has, I think it's 8 gig, even though that other one takes external power, this one doesn't. Even though that other one is more of a gaming card and this one isn't, um, this one hangs right along with it with that encoding, which I very much appreciate. And it gives me another avenue that I could use this card for besides a gaming card. If you are looking for a, a cheap, easy, fast type of way to render video, it's not going to work for, for like things like Twitch or anything for live streaming yet. But for uploading YouTube videos and, and things of that nature where you can use an AV1 encoder, oh, heck yeah. And given that you don't need extra power to run it, given that it, it has a fast encoder and it's inexpensive, this is a perfect use case for it. If you're looking for a video card and you're trying to, you're budget minding, say a, a newer build, and you want something to hold you over for a little while, and you're not a heavy AAA gamer, but you do do some editing and, and things of that nature, some productivity, you might do some light gaming on the side, this could be a very good fit for you. I mean, it really, really could be a very good fit. Now, Sparkle is not the only one that makes these A350 or A380s. You'll find a couple of these out on the market. You'll find them in lower profile, but they're not going to be single card low profile like that RX 6400 is, which means again, it you don't want to try to use these in those slimlines optiplexes in the first place. But a smaller build or something that's a little bit more tight and confined, it is a shorter card. It does. You don't have to worry about external power. It does fit in pretty easily. And you might even be able to fit it into something that you, maybe you've already got a 1080. Uh, maybe you've got like a 2070 and, and you're trying to use an AV1 encoder instead. And instead of going out and sinking 600 bucks into a brand new video card, maybe you're just trying to get by for a little while and you can sell one or both of those and, and get your new video card. But you still want to take advantage of the different encoder. Might be might be a decent investment to do something like that. Uh, it it works surprisingly well for what it is, and with on newer platforms, I was really pretty happy with the performance. Especially as I said before, I've said it a couple times here, no extra power needed, and it's relatively small. So and it didn't cost a whole lot. It didn't cost an arm and a leg. It's it's uh, for what it is. It's a great value. I, I honestly think that, and I wasn't sure if I thought that with the A750 when it came out. My, I was very much on the fence, and I wanted to see what it looked like and how it did as the drivers that Intel kept putting out got better. Uh, that A750 is actually a decent card now. Still does not do great in DX11, but it's survivable. It's okay. It works. And um, it uh, that, like I said, I can render videos very very quickly those videos would have easily taken me twice the time in the regular h264 or 
you know, the Invent encoder, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and, and retest that. It's been a while since I've tested. But um, just encoding off the CPU, uh, this cuts the time, you know, easily in half. So it could be a really, really good use case. Or, say, if you're using a, a, a Ryzen 5 5600G or something and you need something to fit in, maybe. I'll have to, that may be my next set of tests. Uh, I think I, I would like to test on that because this is a PCIe 4, takes advantage of PCIe 4. Um, I think maybe one thing to do is uh, see if it'll take advantage of PCIe 3, how it'll do on that. So that might be the next thing I test. The other next thing I test, there's so many next things I'm going to test. The RTX 3050 to see if something that rivals this and cost, it does cost a little bit more, but see how it compares to something like this. We'll see. It's NVIDIA's entry into the low budget gpus it might be the next one anyway if you got anything out of the video at all or you learned anything from it go ahead and throw a like on it if you're not already subscribed please do that i'd, I'd certainly appreciate it it'd be very nice don't forget to visit the rest of my socials I, I stream on that purple channel more often i am trying to be a little bit more diligent in how i'm uploading other things we'll figure that out as we get to it but in any case uh, i will continue to post on here i know it's been a little while this thing was a comedy of errors first of all because i had to do so much testing in two different computers Second of all, when I went to go start recording this video, I recorded about a half hour worth of material with no sound. So I had to go back and completely redo all of this today. Uh, I'm re-recording re everything, and then we'll edit and we'll go ahead and publish. But in any case, it was worth it to let you guys know about this stuff. So if you uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and throw a like on it. That'd appreciate it. If you don't do any of that, if you don't like or subscribe or hit me up on the other socials or anything, just do me actually two favors this time. First of all, be nice to each other. Be good to each other. Smile, wave, hold the door open, say good morning, whatever. I always ask you guys to do that. And the feedback that I get from people is that a lot of you guys take that to heart. And I appreciate it because I do too. And the other thing is, don't forget to be nice to yourself. Don't forget to be good to yourself. Do something nice for you, okay? That's all I got for this time. So until I get myself into something I got no business getting into, I'll see you later.